Hey everyone, it's June 25th, 2017, and this is episode 101 of Ep Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me as usual are Megan Arns. Hello. And Ben Charles. How's it going, buddy? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you, Casey? Fine. How's everyone's summer? Awesome. So good. I love summer. Ah! Yeah. It, it, it worries me just a little bit looking at how much I'm getting done. You know, it's like, oh, man, is there a way to do this in the school year? Even even just a sliver of this in some just, way, you know, just have Caleb do all your work for you. That's right. Just stop teaching. I mean, they don't need us. Right. Just stop working. Yeah, that might do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, our guest today teaches at the University of Minnesota Duluth, and he's quite the household name in the percussion world due to his just fantastic compositions and his collaborative performances out there. His latest CD is titled Currents, and he's one of those guys that I could go on and on about his bio and his happenings, but all our listeners already know who Gene Kaczynski is. How's it going, Gene? Good. How are you doing, Casey? Just fine. How's your summer? Do you concur with uh, the sediment I just expressed? Oh, exactly. Yeah, if I could figure out how to get this much done, that'd be really great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, it's great to have you. What are you working on lately? Uh, well, I just got back from Brazil uh, about two weeks ago. So that was like a, a big trip of playing and teaching down there. And now I'm just um, trying to compose a little bit this summer. I'm working on a solo piece for uh, Aaron Ragsdale in South Dakota. Um, and I have a couple other things lined up, uh, hopefully in the fall, to compose some things and uh, perform and things like that. So I'm, I'm actually trying to take it a little easy this summer um, because I'm always so jam-packed with things and trying to find some family time and find a good balance. But it's, it's, just, it's just tough, you know. Um, you know, everything with taking care of a house and all that other stuff. But um, it seems like I just can't control myself. I just keep wanting to play and teach and write. And so it's just always busy. seems like a good family activity as everyone sits around and listens to at percussion every week. <laughs> that, would, that would be great, right? Kids <laughs> love that. You mean your family doesn't do that already, Gene? <laughs> <laughs> No, I haven't convinced them yet. My daughter was, <laughs> I was composing some stuff this morning. I was working on this piece, and my daughter came down and just wanted to play. You know, I have a basement studio. She just wanted to play on the stuff, and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm really trying to do stuff, and it's just hard to, like, really try to get her to understand. So, and, and balance that with trying to get her to be interested and show her some things as well. So I'm sure. working on it. I'm working on it. How old is she? She'll be seven. Uh, she'll okay. be seven in September, so. She's just now getting sort of um, getting it kind of figured out, like what I do, because before it was just sort of like I just play around. But I think she's just kind of going to concerts now and kind of uh, feeling it out. Yeah. So speaking of kids, awesome. I've heard I've heard several musician, career musicians say that, yeah, it's so much harder with kids. But I've also had other career musicians say that having kids brought a lot of focus to their craft and you just seem like someone who you, you just get a lot done all the time um, as far as I can tell so yeah with with one that's seven I don't know how, where do you fall on that that opinion spectrum I think it's hard uh, with, with kids or a job or with um, being married like any kind of life change I think you do need to um, make the make that time that you have really count you know, because when, you know, of course, we were all in grad school, like how much did we practice? It was hours and hours and we really had no other obligation. But now, like if, if we get an hour to do something, it's like we really got to focus and make sure that we get every ounce, you know, out of it as possible. That's sort of like where I'm at now. Yeah, that, yeah. It, not not having to do with family so much, but that reminds me, uh, my friend Kate that studied with Keiko Abe in Japan, I think she said that uh, her students get one hour a day to practice or something like wow. that. And they have to, I think they learn a piece every week. And so wow. you learn the value of doing score study ahead of time, of course, but also like once you get in that room, your 60 minutes need to be seriously used. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Did you say one a week? No, if I said one a week, sorry, I meant they have to learn one piece a week in, I think they have one hour a day. Yeah. A day. Okay. That might've been what you said. Yeah. Seven hours. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah I think, this is something I talk to my students a lot about, about like really practicing smart and maximizing your time. Cause like, I mean, everyone's so busy and they bombard their lives with 
you know, all sorts of things, you know, even if they're not married or have kids or have a job or anything. And so I think that applies to anyone, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, like really maximizing your time. So I have a question related to this because I, in, in trying to maximize my time in the practice room, I've started using timers and I don't know how crazy you guys get about timers. Um, but so I'll block off, let's say two hours to practice. Then at the end of it, um, it's not like I have anywhere to be, it's summer, but I'll sit in, in the practice room and kind of screw around for a little bit and maybe try and play through the piece or something like that. Do you think that's a productive use of time or someone like me should be just using that extra 20 or 30 minutes to practice even more? It's something I've never settled on. I think everyone's different. I mean, everyone learns differently and how one person practices could be completely foreign to somebody else. And I think that self-discovery step, as early as that can happen for students, the better. So if you find that you get more done um, when you've tried other ways, then I think it's, you know, perhaps it's cool for you, it works well. Um, I don't know if anyone practices with 100% efficiency, um, but I think, I mean, I'm definitely guilty of just wasting time too in the practice room and playing something because I get enjoyment out of it or whatever. So I don't know, it's hard to it's hard to balance all of that, you know? My students need a timer playing Rocket League, I think. <laughs> playing what? Oh, come on, Megan, Rocket What's League. What's that? It's I don't a video know either. game. I don't know <laughs> oh, that. Yeah. Gene, do you know Rocket League? No, I don't. Oh, damn it. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> 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 Megan, you enjoyed that a little too much. <laughs> so, so Ben, what I've found timers are so good for is putting a, a limit on my on myself at least, because it seems like there's you could keep going on a, a ceiling on a project. I mean, you could just never declare it done. I mean. Um, for me, what really what started me using timers on myself is watching my students, and it's like I use the the Mark Ford Marimba book a lot, and it's like you know, you're taking three or four weeks to get through two pages of music that has to repeat halfway through or something like that. It's like you're not progressing through this piece enough. So for me, it's a way of saying I'm going to do this part for so many minutes, and then I'm just going to move on to keep myself working through the piece because it's easy just to get stuck in one section for no reason really. Yeah, yeah, sure. Gene, I would love to, I feel like the last time I really talked with you outside of a PASIC or something like that was when you were putting two together. So it's quite a while ago. Uh -huh. So I think most of our listeners know this, but if you don't, Gene has this fantastic book called Two, which is a series of two mallet pieces, and they're just really, really cool, great, good compositions. Um, we use it at JMU all the time. I feel like there's always at least two people ready to perform something out of two. But how has, uh, I don't know, all, all these years later, what do you think of that book and how how's it doing out there? I think the book is um, still stands up well. And I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people playing stuff out of it. And I think it's good because it did start a conversation about, um, you know, two mallet playing and where it fits in the curriculum and where it fits in as a you know a concert um, medium, and I think since I've written the book, I've seen other people write two mallet stuff or at least bring stuff forward that has been written or or, or found some pieces that have been written before. Um, I I also think though at one of the downsides is I think that some people still see the pieces as etudes, and that was my hope that they weren't etudes. Um, even the first couple pieces, of course, they're not going to be um, graduate level solos, you know, um, whereas I think actually the pa the last few solos in the book uh, for me, where I am, are really, really challenging. Probably some of the hardest marimba pieces I've ever played, yeah. um, not because they're the most um, esoteric or most complex um, rhythmically or harmonically, but just technically um, speaking, they're really, really difficult. And I, I really enjoy playing those. Um, and I wish that people would, would, um, regardless of my book, consider two mallet playing, um, in a separate category and not necessarily like a stepping stone to playing four mallets or now even some people are like playing six or eight mallets or some crazy stuff like that. Um, you know, just for technical reasons, but also just practical reasons. Like, you know, if you want to, if you want to like gig or work, I think I, I don't know how many um, 
gigs that I've played um, with four mallet playing, but it's not nearly as much as just playing orchestral or wind ensemble or two mallet stuff in general. And I think if you have real command of holding two tools um, and connecting that to your snare drum and timpani playing, that it'll really better your core musicianship. Um, not that obviously we all play four mallets. It's great. It's very cool. It's your cool rep, but I think there's maybe something left undiscovered there. Um, and people have been doing it. I mean, Casey, your you, pieces are great. Um, and definitely this is not like a be all end all. These are the two mallet pieces because I'm not the first to do anything. And hopefully I'm not the last. I'm just one part of the conversation. I hope. Yeah, certainly. On that note, I was wondering for everyone, what are some of your favorite two mallet marimba pieces? Oh, good question. Outside of, of course, Jean's collection. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Prism, of course. Yeah. You know, I, I I like to have students do that um, Furioso and Waltz. Yeah. Uh, from Challenge Number One, it's three little pizzas by. Uh, I do like these. that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I, like I made that. a like my um, sort of suggested marimba repertoire list for students a while back, not necessarily just for my students, but um, and I tried to include two mallet pieces and like each difficulty level. So of course, Prism was on there, um, but some of the ones that I think might be less familiar to people are: Do you guys know the piece Hammer by Sidney Hodkinson? No. no. I think he teaches at Eastman, um, and Greg Giannascoli plays this piece a lot. He's I heard. Greg played this when I was like 15 years old or something like that, and it really made an impression on me. And I haven't actually heard it since, but it's a cool piece. <laughs> um, and Nebojša Zhukovic has a piece called Fluctus that Evelyn Glennie plays quite a bit, um, which is pretty hmm. killer and ridiculously hard. And then, of course, Julie Spencer's Almost 5 AM, another great two mallet masterwork. Hmm. I do yeah. like Fluctus, yeah. Fluctus is a great piece. Yeah. Um, the one that I would definitely insert here is, do you know fertility rights? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, I know the the last movement, there's different versions that float around that he, he has actually published different versions from what I understand. And um, I would say most times I've seen it and definitely how I play it is a two mallet version, that third movement with tape. And that's a real stretch. Um, but I think it's so much easier to play with two mallets and then just do a little bit of fudging with some of the roll chords that are here and there. There's very few um, rolled chords uh, throughout the movement. It's mostly just like a two mallet kind of um, improvisatory type thing. It's, it's a beautiful piece. I mean, the whole piece is really beautiful, but same with the second movement. I play that two mallets as well. And I just think it's, um, that's, that's one of those pieces that I think could really stand up to a con variations or something else, even though it's very different, yeah. but I think it could be a, a big piece for somebody or, or for the concert hall. And then, yeah. uh, Casey, you have a couple. I mean, White Knuckle Stroll is obviously super popular, but then was it opening? Is that the two mallet one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's no, cool. no. Sorry, uh, Encore and G Major yeah, is another one. one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks, Ben. Um, well, you know, marimba solos, four mallet or two or whatever are cool, but I don't think anybody's going to be playing that anymore because the latest thing is modifying snare drum sticks and putting door stops <laughs> on them. And it took us 14 all minutes anybody's going to be there. writing for <laughs> in the near future. So you have a signature drum stick out, out there, Gene. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> Yeah, of of one, the one that I have, and then uh, the million emails that I get about how to make the one that I have. <laughs> do you want do you want to tell well i i remember you saying it'd be great to explain that because um you might stop getting emails but i don't know how many people are actually listening to this but <laughs> <laughs> you must have known when you created that that it was just gonna like <laughs> come back to bite you <laughs> no yeah exactly i i mean i knew that but i was like well i, I mean i've grown up like just screwing around with things and like you know putting this on that and like whatever and so like just screwing that to a stick didn't seem like that big a deal but um, but apparently people are, some people are really baffled as to, like, some people ask, like, is there like a tape underneath or like, do you like glue it? So like, just trying to figure out like how to do it. There's just so much communication that I'm hoping, hopefully trying to clear up somehow. Um, but because it was involved in, um, the modern snare drum competition, I think hopefully now that it's out there, more and more people will maybe... Uh, at least have the stick or be able to explain it or whatever, you know. But what it is, it's really simple. You just take any drumstick, you drill like a, a small, tiny 
like hole in it wherever you want it to go and it's just one screw that goes in um, i would say you don't have to drill a hole but you might end up like not being able to screw in the screw or anything like that um, and then the doorstop itself you get like home depot or or lowe's or any of those other places and you could try a couple they're like 50 cents each try a bunch and see which one gives you the best uh sound but i mean mm -hmm. who didn't grow up you know playing with those things right on the on the door yeah. I mean, I was obsessed with that. I remember my grandmother's house, and she had them on, like, every door. And I was like, man, I mean, all these years later, I, I thought about it. But I remember, like, sitting on the floor, like, messing around with those things. Our I remember cat, getting in trouble for that. <laughs> so a memory just came back to me. Our cat, you know, we'd, she'd wake us up. We'd pick her up, walk her outside, shut the door, and then we'd just hear brrrr. <laughs> she she flicked the doorstop in our our old house, but um yeah, Mind student of mine is playing it right now. Glenn Coche monkey chant has the little springs on the snare drum. So oh, that piece is cool. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. I love yeah. that piece. Piece is way cool. Uh oh, well Ben, what do you got? Yeah, so I normally try to talk about repertoire that's related to our guest, um, but when I was looking at Gene stuff there's so much of Gene's own music that he plays <laughs> that it was kind of hard to decide. So I decided to do a segment that I'm calling when snare drum gets weird <laughs> because of <laughs> Gene's little, uh, doorstop invention. Um, and I, I started out just kind of researching a lot of the orchestral snare drums background. Um, and if you're interested in sort of snare drum history, there's a great dissertation by Guy Gathro called orchestra snare drum performance and historical study. I think it was from LSU, but don't quote me on that. But if you Google that, you can find it and read it. Um, but anyway, so I wanted to talk about five orchestra pieces in particular that use snare drum in unusual ways. Snare drum was historically sort of before the, I guess, 18th century thought of as a folk instrument or a military instrument. So it wasn't used in serious concert musics, much like brass instruments weren't for quite a long time. It was usually used to depict military in, uh, in opera scores uh, in sort of a program programmatic nature. Um, so the first use of snare drum in the orchestra actually came from an opera. So the first use of snare drum in orchestra was in 1706 by a composer named Marin Marais in an opera called Alcyone. And Definitely it was that. <laughs> actually surprisingly not used in the sort of military march sense that we think of. It was used in the Tempest scene where he calls for several snare drums to roll continuously to sound like thunder and rain. So actually kind of an ahead of his time usage for it. The next big weird uh, snare drum piece that I found was 1813 Beethoven's Wellington's Victory, also called the Battle Symphony. It's not a symphony, it's a mm -hmm. one movement work but it's sometimes called the Battle Symphony. Um, Beethoven uses actually two snare drums on opposite sides of the stage to represent the English and the French side in this battle. And the English snare drum plays in duple meter and the French one plays in triple meter, which I got really excited when I read this because I thought this was like proto Charles Ives stuff, but they actually never play over top of each other. So I was a little disappointed in that. Um, but this Beethoven piece, it was very popular in its day, but it sort of fell by the wayside because it's not that great of a piece, especially compared to the substance of Beethoven's symphonies. And so Beethoven started to take some criticism for it, started to take some heat. And this is an actual quote from Beethoven to his critics. <laughs> Beethoven said, and I quote, what I shit is better than anything you could ever think of. <laughs> so I was right. I guessed it. I, I put that in our little group chat preparing for this. And Casey guessed actually first pious. But then after that, when I said it was a dead composer, <laughs> he said Beethoven. And that was Impressive. correct. <laughs> So on the topic of two snare drums, the one that more, more people are probably familiar with is the 1817 Rossini La Gaza Ladra Overture, which also uses the two antiphonal snare drums. And I think it was in the Guy Gathro dissertation that said that uh, Rossini was the one that elevated snare drum to the status of a solo instrument in this piece. And actually Rossini earned the nickname Tamborosini, not making this up, for his use of the snare drum. As a side note, since we're talking about weird snare drum, it was used by Stanley Kubrick in his uh, film A Clockwork Orange in one of the scenes. It's sort of a famous usage of that piece. So two more pieces left on the list. One is 1922 Carl Nielsen's Symphony No. 5. I think we're all probably familiar with his clarinet concerto, but Symphony No. 5 also extensively uses snare drum in the first movement. There are only two movements. Um, and it's uh, the first movement has been described as a battle between the orchestra and the snare drum.
drum and it gets really weird because at one point the snare drum takes off in his own tempo independent of the orchestra and then the composer also instructs the performer to improvise freely so it's this bizarre thing where i think it's rehearsal 34 35 something like that the snare drum just gets to literally make up anything <laughs> It's super weird. And then at the end of the first movement, there's a, a part marked Molto Lontano, which in Italian means far away, and it's often performed off stage. And then the last work for a weird snare drum today comes from 1926. It is the Bartok Piano Concerto Number no. 1, in particular Movement 2. Bartok states in this concerto and the notes at the beginning of it, the percussion, including timpani, must be placed directly next to the piano at the front of the stage. He gives very specific instructions on stick and mallet choices and beating spots on snare drums with snares on or off. And it's sort of a very obvious proto second movement of the sonata for two pianos and percussion in that it is night music. It has that sort of eerie, creepy sound that we talked about on episode nine with Ian Rosenbaum. So that's my uh, little segment on weird snare drum for today. <laughs> Wow, Ben, it, was well, that just was that just your choice of greatest hits, or did you like how did you determine which ones well, to, uh, I started, to choose? I started. I started. I was actually going to do like a little history of the snare drum, snare drum excerpts, but like everyone knows Kiji and Bolero and Scheherazade and all this stuff, so I really didn't want to talk about the pieces that people knew. So yeah, I just yeah, started dude. sort of shuffling through and finding these weird uses of the snare drum. So and that's great, dude. I hope you yeah, do. A I part. actually I, I listened to all of them um, and. Yeah, it's like not that often that I just pick five new pieces to listen to all in one day, but good stuff. Wow. Yeah, thanks, Ben. That's that's fantastic. I hope you do a part two, three, four, and five. That's great. Well, I think we should go to a Facebook question for Gene as I'm just looking at the time here because we do have a few to knock through. Gene, I have to say this was probably the hardest I've ever worked to sift out actual questions. <laughs> <laughs> So just a lot of jokes and a lot of uh, banter. I think we're about, you know, one serious for about 15 jokes. But the first one is from Kramer Smith. Thanks for the question, Kramer. He says, I've found that the biggest hurdle I have when composing is just getting started. How do I overcome this? Well, that's a that's a pretty loaded question. That's tough. Um, I think it, it depends on everyone's background. If you're really... Um, haven't done any kind of composition, I might suggest you start with transcribing something or arranging something. Uh, if you take a piece and just uh, transcribe it for marimba or arrange it for marimba quartet, and that'll at least get you thinking about some creative um, tools that are necessary for the compositional process. And then you could take it to the next step of um, just creating original music and then go through that same process of arranging your original ideas for whatever soul instrument or ensemble that you choose. Um, once you get into that um, place, uh, it, it can be lots of, lots of different things uh, can happen in terms of how you might want to craft your time. You know, composers always say write every day and that helps you. And I, I'm guilty of not writing every day. I only you know, usually write um, when I have time. If I was actually, I guess, a full-time composer, I don't even really consider myself a real composer. <laughs> if I was actually really doing it, I would probably try to write every day and, and create a whole database of ideas and sketches. Uh, and I do have, um, you know, sort of a small da a database of ideas and sketches, which I think would be really helpful if you're not ready to compose something grand, but you shouldn't, I guess you should start small and write a little bit every day or as often as you can. And then you come up with some ideas and sketches and maybe one or two will come to mind. And then you can decide how you're going to explore that. One thing that I do a lot is, um, two things. I study a lot of scores and I figure out, um, you know, outside of theory and history classrooms, you know, if I'm just looking at a score and listening to a piece, what makes that piece tick? Like, how is it orchestrated? You know, I went through this a lot when I did, um, about a year ago, I did a, an orchestra piece uh, with percussion, and, and it was way beyond what I thought it was going to be. And I spent tons of time analyzing pieces and figuring out, like, what makes them tick? Like, why does this sound like this? Um, and so was, there's a lot of training. It's not necessarily... 
um, all just creative. Oh, this person's very gifted so they can construct this piece. There's a lot of step-by-step -step training that I think you need to go through um, and, and, and realizing what works and what doesn't work. And so perhaps just starting with a simple idea and try to write a one minute piece and see if you can go through the steps of, you know, okay, I've seen this piece, it presents material, it develops it, and then it comes back. Maybe you can try to do that. And then slowly analyzing pieces that you like and, and see a way to integrate those tools um, into, into what you do. I guess that's sort of a, I don't know, Casey, what do you think about this? Well, I think everything you just said is, is really great. I, th I think I, I wish composers, at least tra in training, would be more like performers in training because I, I feel like we have a real clear separation. You practice your scales and your fundamentals and you practice stick control, and we do that so much. But I feel like composers, they're often just trying to take a crack at a composition, so they just dive in and try to start writing, and they find, I, I imagine what Kramer's describing is what they often describe, well, I got started, and I got eight measures through, and then I just didn't know what to do next. But I think maybe the approach should be, okay, why don't you look at this little simple Beethoven antecedent consequent and just look at the melody, and now why don't you write your own melody and just have it go through all the same motions that Beethoven's melody did. Just try to recognize what he did to this melody and do the same thing to yours. So if his contour goes this direction, yours goes that direction. And you just don't have a goal of, okay, I'm like getting a piece out of this, but like you said, I'm just practicing out of it. Yeah, so, I think, and not everything is gonna be, um, you know, not everything is going to be great. I think the more that you do it, the, the better it becomes. The other thing I'd like to throw out there that I see often is that um, it's hard to see the forest for the trees sometimes, and everyone gets so worried about um, where the path is going step by step and ignoring sort of the macro or the larger structure. So if your goal is to write a one-minute snare drum piece, um, you should look at the whole one minute on a macro scale and decide you know, where you want to be at the different points. If you decide it's be two parts or it's going to be three parts, then um, then you could figure out how to maybe navigate it a little better rather than having just a blank page and you're just starting and you just keep going until you feel like it stopped. Um, you think about the structure and proportion, I guess, is another great thing to keep in mind when you're just starting. I, I find myself saying that same thing. And thanks for asking me, by the way, um, let, letting me get my, my thoughts. But uh, I, I say the same thing as well. Like, try to have a big picture. I, I don't see the point of starting until I know how it's going to end. And it reminds me of this uh, ongoing conversation I had with a composer named Lachlan Fife in, in my uh, uh, master's studies. And it was always the debate, what's harder, starting or finishing? And it was such a fun discussion. We're both young, and it was fun to bounce these ideas off each other. But he said, oh, yeah, starting is so easy. I can just start, but finishing is so tough. And I was always the opposite way. Was, no, I can finish. If, if I can just start, I can definitely finish. And that's, I think, because I, I agree, it's really helpful to have a big picture idea, even if it's a really, really simple idea. Did yeah. you both start writing in college or earlier? When, when did you start, Gene? I started writing, yeah, mostly in college. You know, I always wrote a little bit for that, and that, I think, is a good sort of gateway. Um, of course, if you end up going in that route, it could be real serious. But I think um, if you're just writing for high school drum lines and things, it could sort of get the creativity going and and and, and be a good start. Um, but then I think, yeah, college was mostly – where it sort of began, but I was really timid and not really sure. I did a lot of arrangements and things and kind of just goofed around with it. I was sort of like worried, like, okay, well, you know, I don't mind to like write a piece, you know? Uh, uh, so really after school, I guess, before I decided I was really going to try to write pieces and, and have people play them, which even now seems kind of um, pretentious to me, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So yeah, I, thanks for asking, Megan. I, I started uh, middle schoolish, I think. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, it is weird to think I still play some of the pieces I wrote in college, which is, yeah, could be really embarrassing because you look at them and you're like, dude, I didn't know what key I was in. Look at this, you know. <laughs> 
but uh, and then of course there's gobs of them that I I don't play anymore because <laughs> I think they're a drag. But yeah, <laughs> sorry, Ben, you were gonna say something. Yeah, so I have a question for Gene in particular. Um, one thing I've heard about with composers is that it's generally I think pretty easy to write for your own instrument. But for example, harp is an instrument that if you don't know the ins and outs of harp, you really can't write for harp. And Gene, I know you've written for bassoon and choir, so could you tell us about your process of writing for these unfamiliar mediums? Sure. Um, I think the best way to start is maybe get them in a room and, and figure out what they can do and what they can't do. I mean, obviously, you can find go on you know Wikipedia and like what's the range of a bassoon, and then get going. But uh, I think you really need to meet with this person. And for me, um, I really want to write something idiomatic, and that's not you know just something crazy because I, you know, played it on the keyboard with my fingers. Um, for example, the choir thing, um, I was always sort of. Um, in tune with what choirs can do. I sang a lot of choirs, but when I decided I was going to write this, I took a tape recorder to a choir rehearsal here, um, and I just asked them to do dozens and dozens of things, um, you know, sing your high slow, sing your lowest note, like, you know, sort of crazy sort of extended things. And I recorded them all and kind of documented what I thought sounded cool. Like, so some of the things you hear in the piece, the stomping and the yelling and the vocal syllables and all that stuff, um, were some of the things that came out of that. Um, and related to your harp uh, reference there, I'm also working on a piece with guitar, and that is ridiculously challenging to write for a guitar. I'm writing a piece for uh, guitar and percussion, and um, for me, it's so foreign. I think wind instruments and even brass instruments, I think more or less, you can just sort of write something, and most of the time, it's pretty playable, um, more or less. But I think you know something like guitar or harp, you really have to be careful with what you're doing. Um, so I, I bought a book and I started studying up on, you know, what fingerings and shifting and, you know, all, all, all this other thing. Um, so I think it does take a, a good amount of legwork if you really want to do something, you know, legitimate with it. Uh, it's, it's challenging. Yeah, I remember hearing Mark Ford talk about writing for choir and I think he said like he wrote it and then they were like, no, you can't, this isn't. <laughs> possible and he had to revise it a bunch the one scary thing about choir is that you don't know if they could sing the pitches <laughs> because if you just push down you know first valve on trumpet you're going to get a b flat um as long as you're in the right partial but you know if you write some sort of crazy line that the tenors can't hear or you know your piece could all of a sudden just crumble you know and you definitely notice that like i've played my marimba concerto a lot of times and depending on the level of the choir, it's like a completely different piece, um, which is a much, much different than playing with a better or worse band or orchestra or percussion ensemble. So it's, you do have to be very careful with voice leading with the choir. And that's something maybe I wasn't completely aware of at the time. I'm glad it's not as difficult as it could be, but um, yeah, be careful, I think. Do you find that if the choir is off pitch, you just can't figure out what marimba note to play? <laughs> <laughs> That funny, right? <laughs> Sorry, Megan, what do you got there? No, it's okay. Gene, I was just curious about if you could tell us um, about your your percussion duo, Quay Duo, with Tim Brocious, yeah. um, how that started, and what kind of projects you guys have coming up, and, and um, kind of the way your ensemble operates. Sure. Um, well, Tim and I went to graduate school together at the Hart School. And uh, I barely knew him. We were there for maybe like a month or something. We first uh, started there. And I saw a poster for um, the Belgian marimba competition. And they had a duo category. And I was like, oh, man, it'd be cool to go to Europe and just play marimba. I'm like, but I need someone else to do this. So I asked him if he wanted to do it. He's like, yeah, sure. So we had no idea what we we're doing. We put together uh, a marimba duo program. And that was sort of like the beginning of, of all of this. So almost 15 years later, we're still playing together. Wow. And, um, and while, of course, we, we went to school together, you know, I, I think Tim and I are, we play really great together because we enjoy the same type of music. We have the same personality. We play similar ways. And um, it just seems to work. And I think it has evolved from the beginning of just doing sort of the standard Sofri duo stuff all the way through today. We're just doing more original and commissioned things. Um, we just commissioned... Uh, a couple of uh, composers, Adam Silverman wrote us a piece. David oh, Gordon, great. 
David Gordon wrote us a piece, um, which we're just about to start. Um, and we're uh, uh, getting a piece from uh, Sejourner uh, at some point soon. So uh, Casey wrote us a snare drum piece. Um, we cool. we got, got the whole cast. And uh, so we're just trying to do some different stuff. Of course, I've written a lot of duos because I can just abuse Tim and just tell him to like play all the hard parts and I can just rock out on like <laughs> um, <laughs> But I think it's it's been really great. Of course, now he's here teaching at UMD with me, and so mm -hmm. it's it's amazing to like play together like almost every day. Um, yeah. You know, we just got back from Brazil, like I said earlier, and we've been traveling a lot um, and doing a lot of, you know, um, local, regional, national, and international, like all all scales. I think, and it's just a lot of fun. Um, I don't know. I mean, I love playing solo music, but I think with sharing the stage with somebody else and like sharing the experience with somebody else and and traveling with somebody else, it's, it's just fun for me. It's a cool, unique mm -hmm. opportunity. So thanks for asking about that. It's, it's sort of yeah. what we're really what I'm really into um, is, is sort of the common thread, actually, even though I've been doing lots of different things over the past 15 years. It feels like even though we've lived in different places and stuff, that was always sort of like a standard you know, I think we're going to keep going with. Yeah, that's really great. And what about the festival in Brazil? Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, we, we were asked to, uh, well, a couple things. One, we were in University of Campinas um, with Fernando Hashimoto. You guys maybe know Fernando. Um, he, he's a, he's a, he's a really great guy. He's uh, organized festivals in the past, but this was the first, what he called, um, the first Congress of Brazilian Percussion. And um, it, I guess it rotates in different cities in Brazil every two years. And so okay. it was pretty big, it was about a week long. And there were, it was mostly Brazilian percussionists, um, but we had met him in Argentina um, three or four years ago at Angel Frete's uh, thing in Patagonia. Um, and so he invited us to come and give a master class and, and performance and that was really great and then we went to rio and played at the university uh in rio and then we went to uh tatui which is a small town um outside of sao paulo and okay. uh, did a week there um at a school that has a relationship with our school that we teach at university of minnesota duluth they're sort of like a um, oh. faculty exchange program so um, our band director here has been there many, many times. And so he met us down there, um, because we were going there and it all kind of worked out. We played the first movement of my, uh, concerto, which is just now being uh, arranged for band and only the first movement is done. So we just, did the first movement, okay. and then we did our own dual concert and we did like tons of master classes and met students and, and we learned a ton of Brazilian stuff. We had some private lessons. We went to the Contemporanea factory and bought some cool gear. And it was a really great trip. It was really cool. cool. That sounds awesome. Yeah, it was fun. I don't know if it was Greg Byer down there at the same at the same festival. Yeah, Greg was Did you see at, him? Okay. Uh, and in Campinas with us for that week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I saw some postings that he um yeah, about about his experiences there. It just it looks like a really cool festival. Yeah, it, it is really cool. I mean, I guess it's the first one. He's done a bunch of other different ones, but this is the first kind of the first of this kind. So okay, yeah, it's really cool. Awesome, welcome back. Oh, thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Megan. What do you have for us today? Well, uh, it's summer now. <laughs> Did you guys know that? <laughs> <laughs> the first day of summer was on, was it Wednesday, the 21st? Um, and I found that I had, I remembered I had reported on this same event last year, um, the Make Music New York Day. Um, and so that's happened again uh, on the summer solstice this year, this, this past week. And it's, it consists of 1,000 free events that invite audience participation and spread across all five boroughs of the city and last from the dawn until the night. Um, it's a festival that originated in, in France or a celebration that originated in France. 
And now um, the organization Make Music New York through NAM uh, has kind of taken on their own event. And it exists in New York, but also in a lot of different cities uh, throughout the United States. And so I came across it. I did not participate in anything this year. I wanted to. Um, and I'll tell you about the event I wanted to participate in in a second. I found a New York Times article reviewing it. Um, so there are two different authors here, Anthony Tomasini and James Ostrike, who were kind of attending different events throughout the city, and they can, kind of gave a take on the things that they attended and what they liked. I pulled out the percussion ones, of course, so I thought I would share a few things that happened in the, in the New York one with you guys. Um, the first one was, speaking of Greg Beyer, <laughs> he was a part of this performance. Um, but the American Museum of Natural History at 12.30 p.m. It was called the Galactic Pulses, and they played uh, the Grise piece, La Noir des Trois. Have any of you guys played that before? No? I think Greg had mentioned it when he was on the podcast, but the musicians were Greg, Tim Feeney, Ayano Katoka, um, Eduardo Leandro, Ian David Rosenbaum, and Doug Perkins. So several of our at percussion guests, but it's for six different percussionists. And they, this happened in the Museum of Natural History and they were kind of spread out in, in a cool way so that you can, it's kind of like surround sound is happening. Um, so that was one, one good quote from this description is here. The music shifted from passages of steady pulses, sometimes muffled in distance, sometimes thumping and animated, through skittish bursts of rattling sounds, gongs, snare drum rolls, and more kept coming. My favorite moment was during one soft passage in with the, which the recorded sound of a pulser was played. It was like a cosmic Indian raga rhythm. So that one was reviewed by Anthony Tomasini. Another one um, was at Joe's Pub Block Party at 1 p.m. It's called Conquering City Noise. And I thought I'd read a little bit of this description. The sounds of the city can be problematic for outdoor music, not by cage, but you can generally count on big drums to make an effect. So a performance by Fumi Tanakade and the Kaoru Wanab... Um, I'm totally not saying these names right, but I'll try. Kaoru Watanabe Taiko Center Ensemble as part of a block party at Aspen Place Plaza seemed like a safe bet. Indeed, it was quite a show. This Tanakade, who is slight built and said to be a pianist, not only threw herself physically into vigorous taiko drumming with club-like sticks, but also sang and played trombone, bamboo flute, and cymbal. She presented only through a couple of, uh, let's see, Mr. Uh, Watanbe, present only through a couple of his compositions used to perform with the renowned Japanese drumming group Kodo. To conclude, she led the ensemble in Kodo's rousing Miyake. So that sounded like a really cool one. The one I wanted to participate in was the Vic Firth bucket drumming at 4 p.m., and that was subtitled Pick Up Sticks. So Vic Firth had, um, had sent out uh, an email to all the educators uh, inviting people to participate in, in these events in all different cities. And some of the drumming cities, some of the cities that were participating were in New York, of course, Boston, Massachusetts, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Columbia, South Carolina, Chattanooga, Los Angeles, Fullerton, California, San Jose, California, Davis, California, Huntsville, Alabama, and Salem, Oregon. And I'm not sure if uh, there could have been others, but those are the ones they were kind of advertising in. But basically what they did is they just had tons and tons of sticks, and they invited anyone who walked by to participate. So they, they described it as, all percussionists who attend, kids and adults, professionals and amateurs, well-heeled and homeless, will be handed a pair of Vic first sticks and invited to make music together. The events will range from structured classes to free-flowing bucket drumming circles, according to the concept of each local or organizer. And um, Neil Larravee, our friend over at Vic Firth, was the one kind of in charge putting this together. So I didn't get to participate in that, but it sounds like it was a really cool event. And the thing I love the most about Make Music New York is and and all the events that are happening around the country is that their audience they encourage audience participation it encourages anyone who wants to do something to get out on the same day enjoy the weather enjoy the longest day of the year and and to make music so it's like that sounds like a great celebration to me <laughs> mm -hmm. so i'm glad a lot of people are working together to make this happen did any of you guys run across any make music events in your communities not here. I I have been to them in Boston before. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, but years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Harrisonburg does get pretty hip in the summer. Stanton Music Festival and uh, Bach Music Festival are both uh, cool events for sure. Well, great. Thanks a lot, Megan. Yeah, no I think we have some more questions for Jean on Facebook. Let's see. One from Robbie Green. Let's switch gears just a little bit. Robbie asks, from your perspective, talk about the state of the Minnesota percussion community and when you arrived and what it has evolved to to date. What have you learned? What has grown? What has diminished? What would you like to see happen more? Oh, well, well, I think um, <laughs> Minnesota is very different. Um, and a lot of states up, up here in the uh, upper Midwest are very different from uh, the East Coast, where I spent my whole life until I got the gig here. Um, and I think... Uh, I was sort of naive moving here and thinking that it was going to be you know, pretty similar as Pennsylvania or Connecticut or Jersey or New York. Um, but I would say, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty different and um, it's actually kind of scary in some ways without putting, uh, without getting too negative. I think um, the, the high school education here for music is actually really in decline. And I see lots of students come in and audition. Um, and those that are local or regional, like really don't have the concept of um, kind of what's going on uh, in other states um, or around the country, around the world. And so um, since I've been here, I've uh, been trying to reach out more and more uh, by hosting uh, honor percussion festival for high school students, being involved uh, at our honor band festivals, uh, the all state um, stuff, um, and trying to get the word out more about some real percussion education. And I think a lot of really great things happen in the Minneapolis area. But once you get outside the Minneapolis area, it could be really, really challenging. And I find that there's a lot of really great teachers um, and really great programs in the Twin Cities area. Um, but I've been having a, a real tough time reaching um, reaching out locally uh, around here. Um, we just had our summer uh, band festival. And so I, we had a whole bunch of students um, which are pretty much local students from the Duluth area. And I just spent a week, like, basically s starting from scratch, talking about what it is to play percussion and um, trying to give them tools to, um, okay, check out these websites or check out on YouTube, and, and here's what you can do, because a lot of them don't have teachers. There's not a lot of teachers around. Um, and I certainly don't have time to, like, teach, you know, middle school and high school students all the time. So, um I'm trying. I mean, the PAS thing is difficult here. We have pretty small numbers. And I know Tim uh, Brocious, who's my duo partner, just became the PAS president. And I know he's starting to try to really get some momentum going to get more people involved outside of the Minneapolis area. Because it's almost like it's its own thing down there. And then once yeah. you leave um, the Twin Cities, um, uh, you know, set yourself behind, uh, you know, 60 years um so it's it's without all the doom and gloom hopefully <laughs> it's it's uh, hopefully getting better um i have seen some some students um come back um to these festivals in a couple years in a row and i can definitely see them getting better and bringing what they're learning back to their school i just think we need um i think we do have great educators in minnesota but i think percussion education outside the Twin Cities area really needs to be looked at. And hopefully I can make an impact on that, but I'm not so sure, um, you know, the best ways to do that, honestly, outside of being a part of reaching out when I can on campus. How far is Duluth from Minneapolis? Oh, it's about two and a half hours. So it's not, okay. it's not really far, but quite honestly, um, you, you've been to Minneapolis, right? Or you yeah, had I was actually just there like three days ago or something. Yeah, I mean, once very you, quickly, just passing through. Once you get out of the suburbs, I mean, there's literally nothing going on. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing. Um, the highway from Minneapolis to Duluth, I mean, you pass through a couple towns. Yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, I'm sure it's the same in other rural areas, uh, like in the south and stuff. Sounds I mean, like Duluth, where I live, like 
from here to Dallas is like that long and yeah, there's nothing. <laughs> yeah. But this, I think this is the difference. I think, you know, um, even, even though you might be in the middle of nowhere, hopefully you still have some sort of, um, finger on the pulse as to what's happening around you. And I feel like, you know, it's pretty isolating up here. I mean, Duluth itself is a pretty hip town, um, a town of maybe hundred and some thousand. And there's a lot of cool stuff happening, but literally like five miles out of town, there's nothing going on. And the programs are small and, and, and arts classes are getting cut. And I mean, the same around the country. So, um, hopefully we can see an uptick, uh, in, in participation and, you know, how much kids are getting. So we'll see. Yeah. It's, it's challenging. Um, it's a whole conversation, I guess, about education in general. It's just, it's just a really kind of, um, sort of a crossroads I think now. It's an interesting problem, I think, for percussion in particular, because if it's, say, a whole band program, I get it. It needs a lot of money. A uh, clarinet player can't do much without a, a, a clarinet, <laughs> you know, which I know, <clears throat> excuse me, I know there are really cheap clarinets and there are plastic ones, but they only get so cheap. You can do so much with sticks and a pad, yeah. you know, um, sticks and a pad will go so far uh, so it's like you said, Gene, you know, if you can just show, get them excited and say, look, website performance, um, get excited about this stuff. It's really cool. Man, they can do a ton with sticks and a pad. But uh, unfortunately, kids get much more excited about shiny cymbals and big drums and uh, yeah. things that cost a lot of money. The thing that always um, that I, that concerns me is that, um, you know, in no, I, I'm afraid that there's a lot of band directors that don't have a percussion background that don't really know what to do with those kids. And they think maybe I'll just play a, a band piece, a program, a piece that kind of features them a little bit. But even then, I mean, we all know that's not really challenging them the same way that it challenges the violinist and orchestra or the flute player or something. So I, I think um, that's the challenge is to reaching those students that do have a lot of potential, but have no access to any kind of education, um, at least giving them a way to self educate, you know, through, you know, there's tons of uh, ways to do it online. I mean, this podcast alone, let alone YouTube and, you know, the Vic Firth website and all that other stuff. So, you know, People have videos all the time, so it's just we're trying to get them to understand that. Well, let's uh, let's switch gears a little bit uh, back to composition somewhat. Back to a question from uh, another one from Robbie Green. Thanks so much, Robbie. What are you currently drawing your inspiration from? Where have you found your inspiration in previous years? Other than you, Casey. Well, of course, yeah, yeah. You know, I've been telling everyone I'm a major contributor to your book, to two, you know. That's right, exactly. Yeah, major contributor. <laughs> um, I think for me it's always been listening to music, and, and not like more percussion music, but like listening to a really great symphony or a really great performer and, and sort of get inspired that way. I think um, – Recently, it's been a lot of like popular music and world music, um, and I can take from that uh, perhaps something interesting or something that breaks apart, you know, some congestion in my brain um, back to composing something rather than okay, well, I'm writing a marimba solo, so let me listen to a hundred marimba solos. I think that's sort of the antithesis of of how I want to operate um, because I want to bring something new or something different to it, and I think inspiration of course some people get inspired by you know their family or walking around and looking at the lake or something like that and and not that, that none of that has come into play for me but i think um the thing that i always come back to is just listening to other music or um even improvisatory music or world music and see how that might make me think differently about things um yeah i, I guess that's my my answer for that yeah, sure. Great. I was going to ask you a little bit. Are you, are you still on the PAS competition commission or uh, committee? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You are. What? Yeah. Have, how, how many years have you been on that? And what have you what have you learned from that? I imagine you learned so much putting those things together and seeing the students and seeing the judges. Yeah, I've learned. I've learned a lot. I've been on it. Let's see. 
I've chaired it for five years, and then I was on, I think, three years before that as a committee member. So um, I think eight, maybe nine years. I At first, when I, you know, Chris Hanning, who was my former teacher, was the chair, and he's a great guy, and he asked me to be on the committee. I said, sure, well, what, you know, how, how hard could that be? You spent a whole year to put a contest together. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's pretty amazing how many details really need to be uh, lined up to have a successful and fair competition, um, getting the right judges and choosing the right repertoire. And, uh, you know, there's just so many things and how long it might take to resolve one tiny issue about one tiny word in the application form. Um, so I've just learned a lot about detail, I guess, and making sure that um, everything's very fair because my opinion of what might be fair or cool, um, oh, it's totally cool. I'll just play this. What's the problem? Well, the next committee member might say, oh, this might be the problem. So I think just learning how to, you know, think about things, uh, with an open mind and be really fair and detailed. Um, that, that's been a good challenge, a fun challenge, I guess I could say. Um, it's nice of you to say it that way. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a professional of you to say. <laughs> it also has been interesting though to see like how people judge as well. Like I know Casey, you you've done it a few times, and and you're uh, really great. Um, I mean, I don't have to say that, but I'm I'm saying that anyways. But nice of you to put it that way. <laughs> Very professional. <laughs> <laughs> you provide so much great feedback. Oh um, yeah. With the comments and all that, and not everyone is like that. And for a lot sure. of the students that apply to this, like that's their big takeaway is, you know, they're not going to win the competition. Um, but to get amazing comments from seven people um, that are like, you know, the top of the field is is something really cool. And it's been taking a long time to figure out how to choose those people that, that will um, understand that and provide that kind of feedback so that the whole thing is, is worthwhile, you know, for everybody. Because I know it's sort of a thankless job for the judges and for the committee. But I think... Hopefully it pays off when the students, you know, and this year actually is really great. Um, there's more participation than ever. Um, we started a new way of sort of branding the contest because uh, the old way was that every year it was a different category. It was going to be a multi solo, then it's going to be five solo, and and I think um, participation was always up and down because everyone was, you know, not sure what it was going to be. Um, or what, you know, was, you know, who it was or if they could send a student or when it was. So now we're just trying to make it, it's completely open every year, 20 minutes solo tape, whatever you want to play, mm. completely open. And you'll be, if you want to play marimba for 20 minutes, or if you want to play chime solo for 20 minutes, whatever you want to do, um, whoever the best artist is, solo artist. Um, and, and that's the idea. And already this first year has gotten more interest. And I hope that you know, it could be something as simple as somebody's going to upload 20 minutes of their senior recital, and that's their tape. And mm. I think it could be cool. Yeah, yeah. Do you find, you know, we've talked to a lot of guests who have all sorts of different affiliations with PAS, including current and past presidents. And, I mean, it seems like there's so many, I don't know, there's often so many issues people have with PAS or things they're upset about. I mean, there's just so many moving pieces and it's a big organization that's just going to happen. Do you ever find that you're in the, the crossfire of this in the competition and it's just, you, you yourself feel like, man, this is a very thankless job from a administrative standpoint. Yeah, I do. I mean, it's like, exactly like you said, it's tricky, like in the, in the crossfire, cause you want to, you want PAS to be this great thing. And, and of course, like just going to PASIC for me and, and reading the articles and things like that as a student, it really bettered me for sure. And so it's something I want to do to be a part of the giving back thing. But I know, you know, obviously we can't, the elephant in the room is like all these people in this other camp that think that it's, you know, why, why would you go to PASIC or whatever? There's so much else going on. And like, why would you want it to not succeed? You know, um, of course, I, I think, there's no good decision, and when you're an organization like that, you have to make decisions uh, financially and educationally and every level, and you can't really just think about one decision and be like, oh, well, I don't like this organization because they have too much marching band or whatever. It's like, you know, I, for me, I just, you know, regardless of what anybody thinks, I just 
hoping that I can give back for the reasons um, that, that I said, like that they've given me the basic experiences when I was a student and the articles and helped me write my DMA paper and things like that. So mm-hmm. I think it's time for me to, you know, I, I, I guess for me, I just don't worry about it and try to give back when I can, you know, obviously yeah. sort of committee is, is one way. I get frustrated when I hear, I guess, certain criticisms and most criticisms that I hear just because, I don't know, it's it's volunteers. You know, people will talk about, yeah, you know, they'll talk about PAS like it's the man, and I just don't. I think they're wrong. It's not the man. It's a it's volunteer. And also like, what else do we have? (laughs) You know, so like if that doesn't exist, and if we don't make it better, what is there? Nothing. So. Right. I mean, PS is not going to become like a Fortune 500 dollar com- or Fortune 500 company and like start paying all these people to, you know, participate in whatever. So, yeah. yeah I mean, it's is really like a really great drum club that we should all <laughs> want to like give back to and and help each other. You know. Hey, well, you guys, thanks so much for listening to episode 101. Megan and Ben, thanks so much for your segments. And yeah. Gene Kashinsky, man, great to catch up with you. And thanks for coming. Thanks, guys. Yeah, so great to talk to you. you All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll catch you at episode 102. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.